Hey, welcome back to Robot Cantina. Today in episode 21, we're going to continue with our fuel injection install on the 420cc cement mixer engine. If you're new to the channel, don't worry, we're not making a fuel injected cement mixer, although that would be cool. Nope, we're just upgrading the engine that we're already using in our street legal go-kart. Anyway, this is the second episode in our fuel injection series. If you find this stuff interesting, then you want to go ahead and check out episode 19 where we bench test the entire system. Speaking of episode 19, I do recall saying stay tuned for future episodes, just in case there are any updates. And sure enough, we have a bunch of changes to cover in this episode, so it's a good thing you all came back. Now this is the same type of 420cc Predator engine that we're currently using in our street legal go-kart, and of course this one's also Hemi. Now the Hemi version has a different cylinder head, and has one more foot-pound of torque when compared to the standard engine. Yeah, whoopee, an extra foot-pound of torque, but every little bit counts. Now let's go ahead and pull off the tin and get started with the fuel injection stuff. Get over here! We ain't gonna need this carburetor. I think we'll also pull the throttle linkages along with this cover. Oh yeah, and the exhaust. Eventually we'll strip all the linkages from the cover and put it back on the engine. You see this tin is also part of the cooling system, but for now let's get it out of the way. Alright, so this is a good starting point. Actually a better starting point would be to give a brief overview on how the original magneto system worked. So a magnet embedded in the flywheel passes under the magneto when the flywheel spins, and this will generate a little bit of electricity. And that power will get stored in a tiny capacitor inside the magneto, and that's used to power the ignition coil. Now when the flywheel gets to a certain point, the magneto is triggered, and that's how we get spark. It's all very simple. Let's slow this down. The white stripe on the side of the flywheel is where the magnet is. Anyway, Let's take a closer look. So I stopped the flywheel exactly where it triggers the magneto to spark. I believe the trigger circuit is sensing the change in magnetic field right about here. Now the reason I say that is because the engine's at 24 degrees before top dead center, and that's pretty close to where these 420cc engines are timed to spark at. Actually, due to varying manufacturing tolerances, they'll fire between 22 to 25 degrees before top dead center, and for the metric crowd, that's 22 to 25 degrees. <laughs> Now that's all cool, but we ain't going to be using the magneto. Nope, instead we're going to use a Hall Effects proximity sensor. And we'll discuss all the problems you may encounter with one of these. Alright, well let's take a look at the ignition setup tab in the fuel injection software. The first item is the trigger offset, and that tells the ECU where the sensor is located with respect to top dead center. So we're currently showing 26 degrees before top dead center, and that's kind of where we want to try to mount the new sensor. I believe this baseline setting is also used during startup, and 26 degrees seems like a reasonable number. Skip pulse is equal 1, yep, that's fine. RPM predictor, that's fine. Predictor gain is 500%. Now that seems excessive, but this is the default configuration that came with the ECU, um, so for now we'll leave it. Next pulse tolerance, meh. Ignition input capture, well, I have a feeling we'll need to change this, and we'll get back to it a little bit later. Let's go ahead and do a walkthrough on how the ignition timing is done with the fuel injected ECU. And it's not anything like the magneto we just discussed. As a matter of fact, this is where most people get confused when setting up the ignition on these EFI kits. You see the crank sensor doesn't actually directly trigger the ignition, although with this kit, the sensor may be directly firing the ignition during startup. I'm not really sure. Anyway, once the engine's running, the ECU calculates the ignition timing based on the amount of time it takes between crank pulses. There's a series of complex calculations based on the internal timers that tell the ECU when to fire the ignition coil. It's actually fascinating how this all works, but for this video we'll skip the two hour lecture and just deal with the basics. So off camera I fabricated this bracket to hold the sensor. Now we can mount this sensor in the space previously occupied by the magneto. Alright, well let's power up the sensor and see how it works. Now these Hall Effect sensors normally operate at 24 volts DC, but they work fine anywhere between 5 and 30 volts. And right away we have a problem. You see the sensor should be on right now, but it ain't. So let's try to figure this out. Okay, it turns on here, but not here. And it looks like it turns on here as well. Well this turns out to be a huge problem, and there's no easy solution. 
You see these Hall effect proximity sensors can only detect the south pole on a magnet, and the magnet attached to this flywheel has the north side facing out. As it stands right now, we're getting two triggers, one right next to the other, and that will not work with this CCU. It'll actually confuse the ECU and the engine absolutely will not run. <laughs> you such a dumbass! What are you gonna do now, tough guy? Get out of here before I turn you into a grease spot! <laughs> Don't worry folks, all is not lost. Just out of curiosity, I checked the flywheel on a 212cc engine, and sure enough, the magnet also faces the wrong way. So the problem is, these industrial Hall Effect proximity sensors only detect south-facing magnets, and as far as I know, they don't make them configured for sensing the north pole of a magnet. However, there is a vendor out there that does sell a sensor that can detect a north pole of a magnet, and I reckon those must be custom-made. The price isn't too bad at $50 each, so that's an option. I'll put the link in the description, and just so you know, I'm not affiliated with this company, and the link is just for your convenience. Anyway, there's another option that will work with a 420cc engine. Let's take a look at the engine already in the car. Looks like on this side of the engine we have just enough space to mount the sensor. Now all we need is a magnet. So here's the plan. This 35mm shaft collar fits the crankshaft perfectly, and all we need to do is drill it and install a magnet with the north side facing out. So for the magnet, we'll be using one of these rare earth neodymium magnets. Now I got a pack of 60 of these through Amazon for 18 bucks, so needless to say, I'll have enough magnets for many years. All right, let's build this. Now the last hole needs to be deep enough to bury the magnet, and that's probably good enough. So the hole is a tight fit for the magnet, but in order to make sure we don't have any problems, let's weld it in place. JB weld, that is. Of course, the instructions don't say anything about not putting it in your hair, so... Anyway, I'm not a big fan of the JB Weld Quick Set formula, and I'm always willing to wait for the standard version to set up, which is usually overnight. JB Weld is the go-to epoxy for everything that's busted. Click on the like button if this stuff's ever saved your ass. Once this stuff hardens, it's nearly impossible to clean up, so now's the time to scrape off any crap on the outside. So JB Weld's good, but just for insurance we're also going to stake the magnet onto the shaft collar. And all I'm doing is displacing some of the aluminum with a center punch to lock the magnet in place. So the next day, this is what we have to work with. Not too shabby. Anyway, let's make sure we built it right. Yep, that'll work. So the shaft collar fits onto the crankshaft perfect, and we can lock it in place by tightening the pinch bolt. I guess all we need now is a bracket to hold the sensor in place. Oh, here's one, and all we need to do is remove a few chunks of metal, and I reckon it'll fit perfect. Unfortunately, the last few cuts need to be done by hand. Okay, here's the finished bracket. Let's see how it fits. Now here's something interesting. This metric engine uses imperial fasteners at key points. Here we're using 5 16 by 24 bolts to hold down the sensor bracket. Now let's see if this thing will actually work. Yep. All right, now we need to lock down the shaft collar at 26 degrees before top dead center. And for that, we'll need a degree wheel and a top dead center finder. The top dead center finder installs in the spark plug hole, and we use this along with the degree wheel to positively locate top dead center. I reckon in a pinch, you could fudge top dead center with some degree of accuracy, 
but setting the shaft collar at 26 degrees before top dead center definitely requires specialized tools. This stuff is cheap, and between the two of them you're looking at 25 bucks. Well worth the investment if you're going to do something like this. So setting the top dead center tool requires you turn the center screw in until it contacts the piston and stops the flywheel from turning. And this is step one. Next you install the degree wheel, and I like to zero it at top dead center, although it's definitely not top dead center, it's just an even starting point. Next rotate the flywheel until the piston hits the top dead center finder. And in this example it hits it at 24 degrees. Now we just divide 24 degrees by 2 and we get 12 degrees. Now we can set the degree wheel to 12 degrees. Now theoretically we can turn the engine in the opposite direction and it'll stop at the 12 degree mark. And sure enough it does. So the degree wheel is now in the correct position and can accurately point to top dead center. Next we can unscrew the top dead center finder and we can rotate the engine. And that's true top dead center. And here's 26 degrees before top dead center. So we want the sensor to turn off at exactly 26 degrees before top dead center. So the idea here is to rotate the shaft collar in the direction the engine normally spins and set it in place exactly where the sensor turns off or right after the magnet passes under the sensor. What we're looking for is the trailing edge of the signal to be our trigger point. And that looks about right. Now all we need to do is tighten the pinch bolt. Now let's go back to episode 19 and the awesome system schematic that I drew with Windows Paint. Eh, it gets the job done. Alright, so yeah, we're moving forward with the wrong sensor, but we fixed that. The sensor we're using is a common $9 Hall Effect NPN sensor. Now these are used in industrial machines and robotics, and today we're using one for our fuel injection system. So the way the sensor works, it'll detect the south end of a magnet and then turn on. The output of the sensor actually goes to ground, or in electronic speak, it sinks low. And that's fine. After all, all we're looking for is a signal, and whatever the polarity is really doesn't matter. Now I'm going to quote a passage from the Megasquirt Bible. If the sensor switches the ground when it sees the magnet, and goes high when it doesn't see the magnet, then set the ignition input capture to rising edge. So that's very clear, and that's what we have, but don't take my word for it, let's look at the instruments. So according to the fluke, we have 12 volts when the sensor's not triggered, and when it's triggered we have 0 volts. So that matches with the scripture as written in the Megasquirt Bible. At this point we'll need to change this field to rising edge. Okay, so the fluke is good at measuring voltage, and it's probably one of the best meters on the market, but it can't show what the signal looks like when the crankshaft is spinning. Let's take a look. Nope, the signal's too fast for the fluke to read, so we're going to need an oscilloscope. Alright, let's try this again. And there we go. Now let me stop it right here, and we can look at the waveform. Now right here is where we're going to capture the crank position signal, and that's the rising edge. These old oscilloscopes are dinosaurs to the younger generation, but they're great for playing around in the garage, if you know how to use them. This is an old Tektronix and still works great after 30 something years. It's big, but it does the job. Now I'm not trying to sell you an oscilloscope, but there is a cool little scope available just about anywhere that sells cheap crap, and that includes Amazon. Now this little guy ain't a Tektronix, but it's something I keep around because it's handy. I think I gave $40 for it a few years ago. I like it and I hate it. I like it because it's portable, and I hate it because it ain't got enough knobs on it. Yeah, there's a reason for all those knobs on the Tektronix. And yeah, this little scope can do simple measurements, but you gotta push multi-purpose buttons, and that gets confusing. Anyway, it's a cheap tool, and if it's used properly, it'll get the job done. Now I can't imagine working on electronics without an oscilloscope, but people do it every day. Maybe I'm just spoiled. Anyway, the crank trigger is officially solved, and the next item up is the throttle body mounting. Now that should go a lot easier. In order to mount the throttle body to the engine, we're going to have to make an adapter to bring the two together. And unfortunately, it looks like we're going to have an interference problem. Now, I like problems. I think this whole video series is about problems. And what's one more? So here's a rough sketch of some critical dimensions for the throttle body. The flange is 48 millimeter and is offset to the right by 2.5 millimeter. And here's the chunk of aluminum we're going to be making it out of. I cheated and found center by chucking it in the lathe and lightly hitting it with a drill bit. It's a lot more accurate that way. Now I don't like scrabbing critical lines on shiny aluminum, so let's paint this with Dyke and Blue. 
It took a few minutes for the layout fluid to dry. Now we can scribe some lines. The first thing is to mark out the 2.5 millimeter offset, and I'll just use the calipers to mark this. All right, just to be sure, I'm gonna lightly punch this offset, and that'll help me keep things lined up. So I put the scribe in the lightly punched hole, and then I run this straight edge right up against the scribe. Sort of cheating, but it works for me. And then I just scribed a line across the face of the adapter. So now we need to mark where the flange studs will go, and they should be 24 millimeters from the center. And now we can center punch the holes. Now let's grab some dimensions from the cylinder head. You know, it may be easier to look some of this stuff on the internet, but measuring also seems to still work, most of the time. Let's go ahead and drill some holes. So two of these holes are sized for 8mm fasteners, and we also have to countersink them to eliminate the interference problems. And for the final cut, I'll use a mill bit, and this will give the fastener a proper seat. And you can see how the bolts fit nicely. Let's do a trial fit. Okay, fits great. I think we're on the right track. These two holes are for the throttle body, and we'll have to tap them for six millimeter threads. But first, I think we'll take a visit to the lathe. This chunk of aluminum was scored on eBay, and it's 6061 alloy. And well, I really like to use 6061, especially on the lathe. Now I'm drilling out the center to accept a half inch bolt. This is so I can mount the adapter differently and work on trimming down the outside diameter. You'll see. Well, this is the finished part, and it should work fine. There's plenty of clearance for all the fasteners, and I even milled the chunk out of the back to clear the plastic carburetor insulator. I think this insulator will help keep the throttle body and the injector from absorbing heat from the cylinder head. Throttle body fits perfectly, and in my collection of misfit drill bits, I had a 28mm bit, so that simplified boring out the hole. Overall, not too bad. Now let's see how this fits the engine. The best part of making something is putting it all together at the end. Now I suck at bowling and golf. Actually, I take that back. I always get high score when I play golf, but I guess that intimidates folks. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, the adapter fits the engine really well, and I reckon custom made parts will do that on occasion. Well, the two hardest parts of doing this fuel injection conversion are pretty much done. The rest of the system should go together pretty quick. Now I took a little bit more time with this video just to make sure I covered some key points and what to expect when things don't go right. The alternative mounting of the crank position sensor is not a half ass fix. There is actually a reason I did it that way and it will be more clear in future episodes. I could have easily just ordered the custom sensor but eventually I was going to move the sensor over to the other side anyway. So problem solved for now. Well I think we made some real progress and I'll go ahead and enjoy the rest of your day and thanks for watching. Oh and if you enjoyed this video 
click on like if you haven't done so already. And it would really help me if you clicked on subscribe. Until next time. So the camera pans to the right and you'll see the gnome. And uh, I guess he'll say something funny and then run away. So, uh, so I'll go ahead and film that. You guys think that'll work?